I'm going to begin by confessing two things. First of all, I haven't found anywhere a good introduction to this topic that I want to cover today. Uh, and what I want to cover today is the topic of identity from the perspective of authentication, proving you are who you say you are. And the second thing I want to confess is I'm not that good at it. Um, I wish I was better. I wish I knew this inside and out like some people do, but I don't. So I'm going to do my best. Um, I think other people could do this better, but my problem is they haven't. And I'm still looking for some really good guides to this. So that's basically where I'm starting from. Um, so I'm working with XSplit here and XSplit is very slow for some reason. So you'll hear me clicking on the computer a lot, but that's life. So here's where I'm going to begin. I'm going to begin with something called a UB key. And what a UB key is basically is a key that you plug into your computer and that's what you use to sign on instead of a password. There are different versions of it, but they all function pretty much the same, right? So we'll just pick one. 5 Series, Neo, whatever, it really doesn't matter. Uh, they're all slightly different. Let's pick Neo. Back to step one. No. <laughs> okay, so I've selected this. So suppose you have this on your keychain, and now you want to log into Google, Facebook, Twitter, etc. Let's, let's go with Google. So what do you do? Well, if we look at this, right? Uh, you get your key, you add your key to your account, so you're going to have to do a bunch of stuff. Um, you know, not really that hard, right? Uh, go to two-step verification, add your key, and then if it has a disk, tap it. And what that's going to do is communicate back and forth with Google. And then in the future, you can just sign in with your key. So you sign into your Google account, connect your, you know, connect your key. If you see a message from Google Play Services, tap it. If not, just move on uh, because you haven't turned on your key yet. Okay, that's it. Uh, so let's look at something else. Let's try Twitter. All right, so it's going to be pretty much the same sort of process, right? So you're going to add the key to your account and then you're going to plug it in when you want to use it. Uh, let's look at, uh, oh, I won't use GitHub, it was horrible. <laughs> uh, Windows. So here's Windows, right? You can log into your Windows with your UV key. So same sort of thing. Um, you can probably watch the little video there. But basically, you'll download a, a YubiKey app from the Microsoft Store um, and then follow the instructions, which will basically involve setting up your account on your computer and then logging in with it by putting in your key and pushing the little button. So that's pretty non-technical. Now, first statement of the day that's really important. Something like this is how everybody will be logging into computers in the future. Uh, this whole password business, done. Done and done. Uh, it's insecure. Even the two-factor authentication where, you know, it, it sends you something by phone, um, no. No more. <laughs> uh, it's done, right? Um, because, you know, two-factor authentication is only as secure as your weakest factor. And in this case, it's the phone, right? Somebody knows I have two-factor authentication on MailChimp, say, and they have my phone, they're, they're in, basically. So, no. Um, we're going to use keys. And the reason why we're going to use keys is twofold, really. First of all, it's a thing, like a phone even. Uh, you know, it's an a, a actual physical token, and you can't log into it 
without actually having the physical token. So it makes it really secure that way. You have to lose your token in order to lose your access. And you're probably thinking, well, what if I lose my token? Well, uh, that's okay. There are mechanisms in place, um, you know, that help you back up your token. You can generate a new token if you do it properly. Um, so that's the one thing. And the second thing is a lot of these are using what's called uh, public key encryption or you know, it's another way of saying, I don't want to call it two-factor authentication because it's not it's something different. But basically the idea here is you're using a public key and a private key and working back and forth. So uh, that moves us on. So first of all, before I go on, the, uh, there's a public standard for these little plug-in keys. It's called FIDO UTF. Uh, it's an open authentication standard. And, and that's why that's why it's going to happen. And generally, right here, here's how we'll how we'll use it. Right, unlock the phone with biometrics, or enter your name and password, touch key and insert button. You see, either way, right? You log in, you use the key, you're in. The key protects against protects your device. So, okay, what is the other thing? Um, so there's this thing called two-factor authentication. So what you have is a public key and a private key. Um, so I like to, I, I really hate the way they've named these things. I, I don't think they're very clear, um, but okay. So think of the private key as your key, but think of the public key as a lock. And so your private key fits into the lock. And so you can do things when you have both your private key and your public key that you couldn't do before, right? So if you think about it, right, it's kind of like a two-way security system. If somebody gives you a key and says you can go through the door, right, you can only go through the door with the right lock. And if somebody has a door and they give you a key, you can go through the door only if you have the right key. So it's these two things combined that make actions possible. So there's a couple of examples. Here's one example, okay. Um, this is Alice. And she's going to send a message and she wants to prove that she has sent this message. So she writes the message, say, I will pay $500. And then she uses her private key to encrypt the message. And there it is, the message is encrypted, right? And then she sends it to Bob. So she's used her key to lock the message. Bob has the lock, right? Her public key, right? Bob can use the public key to verify that, in fact, it was locked by Alice and nobody else. Because nobody else can encrypt it quite the way Alice can encrypt it. So Bob checks Alice's message, sees that, yes, it does open uh, with this key and says, great, I got a message from Alice, I know it was from Alice, she says she'll pay $500. The neat thing is too, Alice can't deny that she said it, right? Because only Alice can sign that key because Alice, she keeps her private key private. This is the key to this whole thing. Your private key stays private. Nobody ever sees your private key but you. You don't send it to Yahoo, you don't send it to Google or whatever, you keep your private key. Ideally, you keep it on a device or a key or something like that, but it's yours. The thing that you send out to other people is the public key. And if they have the public key, they can create maybe say a challenge that only you could perform with your private key, right? So something like that. So that's one thing. So what about the other way? Bob wants to send a message to Alice 
He wants only Alice to read the message. So he uses the public key to encrypt the message. And here's the encrypted message. Now, only someone with Alice's public key can decrypt the message. So Alice decrypts the message and receives the message. Now, something to note here, right? It might not necessarily be Bob sending this message, right? Anyone has access to Alice's public key. So really, you know, if you, you want to put it all together, Bob's going to have to sign his message and then encrypt it with Alice's public key and then send it. And then Alice would decrypt the signed message and then check it with Bob's public key and get the, the full security of the exchange from both sides. So, okay. Um, this would work depending on the encryption scheme that you use. Um, it's pretty high overhead in the sense that it takes up quite a bit of computer power to encrypt and decrypt these things. It's not huge, but you know, it's overhead. Um, so there's been a whole infrastructure developed around that based on certificates and so on and so forth. Um, you basically what you do is this, you, you generate your public key and your private key on your own computer. And uh, so there's an application, different applications you can use to do that. So then once you've done that, you register your public key with a third party, a certificate agency. Now, they, you can, you can have self-signed certificates where you're just verifying yourself, or you can have certificates that are guaranteed by, I don't know, a bank, a certificate company, whatever. They will charge you money, and sometimes, and I've had to do this in the past for my website, you have to send them uh, your ID and prove that you are actually who you say they, that you are, and that you actually own this website. You have to go through a process, right? Um, that's a lot of overhead, and it's expensive. So uh, I did it for a little while when I was putting, uh, you know, the, you know how they have the HTTPS? The S is for secure, it's secure socket layers, and it uses this certificate. And uh, so when I switch from HTTP to HTTPS on my website, and you'll notice on the course website, it's also HTTPS. Um, when I first did that, I used a certificate agency and I had to pay them money, more money than I wanted to. Now that I'm on Reclaim, they take care of that for me like a good host should, so I don't need to worry about it, it's just done. So, um, one more thing and then I'll wrap this up. I don't wanna go into too much detail because I'm not as confident as I'd like to be and I don't think it would be helpful at this point anyways. So here's something called Keybase. And it's the same kind of idea as a certificate, but it's more for people than for websites. So what I've done to, uh, to get myself going with Keybase is I've generated a public key. And there's my Keybase public key. And uh, if we click on it, see that's the fingerprint. Right, this key, all their PGP keys, there's a PGP. This is the big, long public key, right? That's why there's some overhead involved here, right? Uh, Etc. So, and I've also verified this key with Twitter and with GitHub. It's a gist, I don't know why it's a gist, maybe secure Git, I don't know. Let's pop in there and look and see what it says. Yeah, it's GitHub. Right, see? And here's my Keybase proof. I hereby claim, and then see, I claim this. So I, I put in some stuff, and I signed this object. And uh, there you go. And there's the signature. Or there's the, the uh, yeah, there's the signature. So, 
I haven't given away my private key, but I have signed this information here. So there you go. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, it also is on a couple of devices, um, on my office desktop and on a paper copy, um, which is, uh, that's a recovery mechanism, right? Remember I said you might lose your key? Now, <laughs> I've lost this paper, so my key base uh, lifespan might be limited, but we'll leave that aside. So, and then other things we can do with this, right? Uh, if I want to send an encrypted message, so here I am, hello world, and I'm going to encrypt it. So here's my encrypted message. Pretty cool, huh? So I can paste this in and uh, nuke the plain text. So the, the plain text is gone. My message only exists as this encrypted thing, right? Um, and uh, you'd have to use my public signature to decrypt it. Uh, I can also decrypt something. Um, you know, I have to be logged in and I have to host my private key with them, which I don't want to do. So they can't decrypt messages for me. I can sign things. So here I can sign things and I can verify something as well. Um, so that's a few things I can do with Keybase. Also, we'll come back here and I've signed a public folder on my website. So here it is, and it's my presentations folder, and I've signed it so that you know this folder actually comes from me and not from somebody pretending to be me. So how cool is that? You, you can't fake it. And then I'm following some people. So that's basically the, uh, the Keybase uh, protocol. And if you dig into this, um, you'll find that it's all based again on graphs. Uh, this is a graph. Uh, here's some of the key, this is key base for everyone. And if you look at that, that's a graph. Uh, key base for, this gets really technical, so you probably don't want to read this, but this is a Merkle chain. And so this is sitting at the heart of key base. So isn't that interesting? So like I said, it gets really technical though, and you know, and, and quite frankly, big chunks of this are beyond me. Uh, I haven't learned them. Maybe I will one day, it depends on how my career goes and how long I live. Uh, but uh, you know, it, it's, it's as, as they said in the past, right? It's, it's graphs all the way down. Anyhow, that's all I wanna say on this. Um, I wanted to include this in the section on identity because it's a really important component of identity. When I asked you to make an identity graph the other day, uh, part of it was so that you would see that you don't actually need a little node that says, this is me. The whole graph is you and you can see yourself or recognize yourself as emergent from that graph. But the other reason I wanted you to do that is because that graph literally becomes your identity online through mechanisms such as public key cryptography, key base, and these little, these little things that you stick into your computer. This is coming uh, 10 years from now maybe give or take, this will be what we do. We'll have our cryptographic ID. We will have our public key like this, which identifies ourselves. You know, the, the fingerprint, which is real quick, the 64-bit real quick fingerprint, and then the big long one. Uh, that's who we will be. Can we have more than one? Depends on how we certify them or verify them. Uh, can they be self-signed? Yeah, maybe. Can I use them for things like Bitcoin and that? Absolutely. Um, there's, uh, you know, if you look up Keybase 
and Bitcoin. Uh, oops, and you have to spell Bitcoin correctly. Actually, it's cool. You probably don't have to spell it correctly. So, so Keybase is now writing to the Bitcoin blockchain. And uh, so, if you want to see that on mine, oh, I, I took it away. All right, uh, let's open this up. Keybase.io slash downs, because I was in early, right? <laughs> so here I am again, right? Um, so where'd it go? Uh, it's here somewhere. It's, it's under something called chain. I, I saw it earlier. Well, there was, uh, when I was looking at this earlier, a chain, and the chain was the representation of all of my activities over time on this. Um, where did I find that? There it is, chain. Right, so this is, these are my activities happening on a chain which could be the blockchain which maybe is the blockchain I don't know all right um, and here is my graph I told you it's graphs all the way down it's a pretty simple graph I told you I'd create my own uh, personal identity graph um, actually I had I lied the other day actually I didn't lie I'd forgotten I did this Here's an identity graph, um, but it's not just something I made up. Um, it's my Keybase identity, my public key, my account on Twitter and GitHub, and I've also verified my website, my office desktop, and then this lemon segment paper key, which is somewhere. I don't know where. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So I wanted to make sure that you saw this because the concept of identity, the concept of identity as graph, the different dimensions, the different things you do, all of the things that you guys put into your graphs can, can end up on this graph. And so your identity, whatever it is, becomes your digital identity, becomes another way of looking at the same thing I guess yeah uh, becomes that public key that you represent yourself with and that public key will be should be unique to yourself still early days people don't have all of their public keys yet or some people have multiple public keys uh, people certainly haven't merged all of their accounts. Like I haven't merged this with my Bitcoin account yet, but they can and they will. So my key base or some equivalent of it might become my Bitcoin identity, might be the way I pay for things and get paid as well as log into things and log in, etc. It's important, I think, that this be decentralized. Um, to a certain degree, maybe not 100%, but certainly to a certain degree, I would not want the bank to be in charge of all this. I would not want Google or Jeff Bezos or anybody like that to be in charge of all of this. I don't want Donald Trump to be in charge of all of this. So, you know, I, and, and as well, there's the question of anonymity. Uh, how much of this do I expose? How much of this do I hide? How much of this do I have control over? And again, can I have multiple identities? Can I link those identities privately? Um, yeah. Interesting questions. So that's my video. I've tried to keep it short, even though I rambled a bit. Uh, but I thought, uh, you know, we can't finish identity without touching this stuff. Because this is going to be huge. Huge. Um, in the online world in the future. It's just one more part of what we're calling e-learning 3.0. So I, I'm Stephen Downs. It's November 15th, 2018, which uh, the historians will note comes way after the invention of all of this stuff. And it just shows how long it's taking to get into the system. Bye for now.
for now.